Thank you all for coming. I'm really looking forward to tonight. This is uh, the time where we normally gather for our Thursday night Bible study and prayer. Um, and we will have our prayer time, but our Bible study will be a little different. We're going to get a word-centered presentation from Tom Meyer in just a moment. We're very grateful to have Tom Meyer and his wife Sarah, newlyweds, uh, who are with us. And so we're very much looking for your, from your, to hearing for your ministry of the Word, Tom. And uh, let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, how grateful we are. For this gathering of believers, we're grateful, Father, for the word-saturated body that this is. We strive to have the word central in what we do. And we are thankful, Father, for the burden that you have placed upon Tom and his wife to minister the word in this fashion to different congregations throughout the country and in different parts of the world. We pray, Father, that you would uh, help us to receive the word as, as it's delivered. May we be encouraged by it. May we be motivated to serve Christ through it, and we ask, Father, that you would accomplish faith through its hearing, for faith does come through hearing. And so, our Father, be pleased to accomplish these things through the ministry of, of Tom this evening, and we also pray, our Father, that you would be with each and every one here, that you would prepare the soil of each heart to receive uh, the word that falls upon it, so that it might bear fruit in the way that only you know it needs to. So, Father, be with us this evening. How grateful we are for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our schedule this evening is going to be much like our normal time together, except we have Tom Meyer, who is with us from Word Sowers Ministries International, and he's going to be presenting different portions of Scripture. He's going to be bringing Hebrews 11 that will be interspersed with different texts from the Old Testament, and then he will bring Isaiah 53. And so we're very much looking forward to his uh, ministry of the Word this evening. Following that time, I'll come up here and we'll work through some of the prayer requests that we normally do and spend that time together in prayer after his presentation. And after his, his recitation, he is going to bring some ways that we can also be involved in the very same thing that he is doing. And we're very grateful for the written word that we can retain uh, for, for precisely when we need it. So, Tom, come on up. So good to have you, my brother. Thanks, Pastor. Oh, you're so welcome. This evening, what I'd like to do is use that famous Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, as our outline and tell you that short account of that Old Testament saint's act of faith, then go back to the Old Testament and tell you their story or a portion of their story from heart. And we'll work back and forth like that for about half an hour or so. Then I want to take a few minutes and talk to you in plain language about why should I memorize God's Word? How do I memorize God's Word? Etc. Our first example of faith in Hebrews 11 is Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken and he was not found. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. In the days of Adam, after he begot Seth, were eight hundred years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh, and Seth lived after he begot Enosh 807 years and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And Enosh lived 90 years and begot Cain, and then Enosh lived after he begot Cain in 815 years and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And Cainan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. And Cainan lived after he begot Mahalalel 840 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Cainan were 910 years. And he died. And Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. And Mahalalel lived after he begot Jared 830 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years. And he died. 
And Jared lived 162 years, and he begot Enoch. And Jared lived after he begot Enoch 800 years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years. And he died. And Enoch lived 65 years, and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah. 300 years and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Let's go to our next example of faith, Noah. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. And it came to pass when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and fowl of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Let's go to our next example of faith. Abraham. By faith, Abraham was tested, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which also he received him in a figure. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and they rose up and went on to the place which God had told him of. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide you here with the donkeys, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again unto you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, and he laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire and his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. 
And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hands upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Let's go to our next example of faith, the parents of Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls which came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. So get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Potom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And the Egyptians were grieved because of the children of Israel. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake unto the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And Pharaoh called for the midwives and said unto them, why have you done this thing and have saved the men, children, alive? And the midwife said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered before the midwives can come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. Now Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived, and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of balrush, and she daubed it with slime and with pitch, and she put the child therein, and laid him among the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to see what would be done unto him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself by the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maids to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. 
<laughs> and the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew, and she brought him onto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Let's go to our next example of faith. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brothers. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. And when he was come out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said unto him that did the wrong, Why do you hurt your brother? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. And Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled their troughs and watered their father's flocks. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flocks. And when they came to Ruel their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today, my daughters? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us and watered our flocks. And he said, And where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Ziphra his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of their bondage, and God heard their groanings. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came unto the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked. And behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Do not come any closer. Remove the sandals from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them, to bring them up out of that land, unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanite, Hittite, Amorite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have surely seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore. And I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth thy people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the children of Israel out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, When I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me to you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me. 
to you. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin and the weight which does so easily beset us. And let us look to the Lord, to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Isaiah 53. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high, as many were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which they have not seen shall they consider, and that which they have not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor calmliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he openeth not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare of his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors and bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Well, we saw the faith of Enoch. We saw the faith of Noah. We saw the faith of Abraham, the faith of the parents of Moses, the faith of Moses, and of course, Isaiah 53. So just one question as we go throughout our remaining week. What are we trusting God to do? What are we having trust in and faith in? Asking, hoping to receive, seeking, hoping to find, and knocking on, hoping that he'll open. What are we asking God to do that only Jesus can do? All right, let's switch gears real quick and take about 10 minutes or so. The last four years, I've been living in Jerusalem, going to school as one hat, being a missionary as another hat, and speaking for our ministry as a third hat. And while I was there, I met my wife, Sarah, who's in the back. Hi, honey. <laughs> and she's from St. Cloud, and so she's one of you. And uh, I'm originally from the Chicagoland area. And um, the best thing about being there was, of course, meeting my wife. But I learned many different things there. And um, I rub shoulders on a daily basis in Jerusalem with people who really memorize. You know, the word Quran means literally to recite. So any serious Muslim is going to have the whole Quran memorized, which is about 114 chapters. Okay. Now, in regards to the Jews, any serious student 
is going to have the Talmud memorized, or parts of the Talmud memorized, which is the oral law. Well, after being in the city for a long time like that, their emphasis and their importance on memorizing their books, which are not the word of God, it really rung a bell in me. If they're so dedicated and so sincere to memorizing these books, I want to find out why. Well, I did a little exploring, and it is of the un utmost importance to have their holy words inscribed in the hearts of the, those particular people. It's of an oral mindset. We live in a written world, a copy-paste, Facebook tweet, file-forget world, where we don't have to remember anything, because, well, we just don't have to, because we live in a written world. But those guys that I just mentioned, they still live in an oral world in some aspects. Sure, they could go home and open up a book and read it, or just pull out their phone and have it, but that's not the idea. The idea is to labor over and to really work hard at putting mass amounts in them. Now, like I just mentioned, their books are not the Word of God. We have the Word of God. So why should we put the Word of God in us? They put the, their false word in them. Why should we put the real word in us? What does it do? Well, that's a fantastic question, and it does numerous things. See, the Bible, as you know, probably was written in an oral world. Most people did not have a complete scroll of the Bible in their house. So there was a really high view then of storing up God's word in your heart, treasuring it, being filled with that virtue of Scripture. You know, Joshua 1, eight. many of us have that verse memorized. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. What does that word mean? Well, the idea is of a cow or a beast outside who's chewing grass and he's swallowing. Then he regurgitates it back into his mouth and chews it more and swallows it. And the process is of calling up at will scripture, chewing on it, thinking about it, and then depositing it. Then whenever you want it again, you just call it back up. And then we get to the time of David in Psalm 1. Right? His delight. Delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, or his Torah, does he meditate, same word, day and night. So there was this tremendous emphasis on putting inside the people the word of God. You see, we are supposed to let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. Not just a little bit. And look, I'm 35 and I've been memorizing for about seven or eight years now. So it's not like I started when I was their age, and it's not like it's easy for me. It's really, really hard, guys. I mean, it takes me at least a month to do one chapter, and that's about 30 to 60 minutes a day, writing it out, each verse, one at a time. But as I look back on it, I say to myself, how in the world, I'm not talking about memorizing books, I'm just talking about verses that are applicable to your life, psalms, etc. How could we not have that in our spiritual arsenal? When Jesus is tempted, he doesn't run for a scroll. He just quotes memorized scripture. In Ephesians chapter 6, everything that soldier you are wearing is defensive, except the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And that word is rima in Greek, which means the spoken word. So it's implying that the soldier has that stored up in him. So when he needs it, he could say, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, right? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, right? The tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. My eyes will not look upon any wicked thing, right? On and on and on and on. That's how you become mature and equipped is by having that in you. That's the easy part. The hard part is obeying it. <laughs> That's the hardest part. But look it, I don't think the Lord would ask us to do something if we couldn't do it. Even though it's hard, and even though it's, it's time consuming, it's the greatest, it's the word of God. It's more precious than rubies. All the things that you can desire are not to be compared unto it. And if that's true, which it is, let's work at it just a verse a week, okay? Pick a psalm a short chapter or something like that and just go verse by verse through it. And by Christmas time, if you did 
Two verses a week, you could have the book of Jonah memorized or something like that. A verse a week, you could have um, like Psalm 32, which is beautiful, okay? Or Psalm 51 or Psalm 90, you pick. It's just sticking with it, a verse a week, and staying with it, and you can do it. You can do it. Well, let's shift gears for a couple minutes. Does anyone have any questions or comments or concerns? Anybody? Well, look, there's numerous ways to memorize anything. Like Pastor and I were talking about earlier, we're interested in the things we want to be interested in, and we're not interested in the things we don't want to be interested in. I love baseball, so I could just go on and on about who's in this division, who's in that division, who's batting this, who's batting because I'm interested in that. Well, how do I memorize that? How do I know all that off the top of my head? Well, because I've repeated it. See, that's the bottom line, is repetition. And there's basically three different ways we memorize. Number one is by hearing, number two is by seeing, and number three is by writing. Now, writing out each verse, like I mentioned earlier, is really what sticks with me. And not only writing it, but saying it when I write it. Because our mouths are very smart, maybe some of us more than others, but they are very intelligent. And when you say it, when you write it, your mouth will help your mind remember it. It might sound a little crazy, but look, up until the third century, everybody, when they read, read aloud. That's why the church father, Augustine, when he's in the library and he sees someone not reading aloud, he has a fit. He's like, how dare you as a student not read aloud? Because everybody read aloud. Okay? But we don't do that today. Only crazy people read aloud. <laughs> but that's the way to do it, and that's the way to remember it, is to read it aloud, even if you're not going to speak it vocally, to move your mouth. Writing, saying it, and repeating it. That's what works for me. Yeah. Anyone else? Question? Comment? Concern? Yeah. Do you have a friend that memorizes scripture as well? Who do you... I'm glad you asked that question. I do have a friend that memorizes it, and it's my best friend, my wife. <laughs> and um, we live on the road. Um, we go from place to place to place, speaking the Bible from memory. We've been in the States for 30 days, and we've been in 11 states, spoken in churches in six different states. And uh, we're, since we're on the road a lot, we have a lot of time. <laughs> and so, you know, we like to listen to music and do everything you do, too. But we spend some of that time speaking aloud to each other. And in Hebrew, it's called, um, oh, what's the word? You're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> it's called neighbor. I don't know how you say it. Hertuva, I think is the word. Hertuva, I think. And basically, what it, the idea is, they do this today in Jewish schools, is I'll sit here on this side of the table, and you sit on that side of the table. And I'll say the first part of the verse, and you say the second part. I'll say the first part. You, cause, right? It's just to sharpen each other's sword. Yeah, so it's great to speak it aloud and to speak it to someone, for sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Good question. Question? Comment? Concern? How do you young people memorize? How do you guys memorize scripture? Um, well, I think review is the biggest part for me because I tend to forget very easily. Yeah, you're in good company. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, saying it out loud is, mm -hmm. I think, it's the best way. Okay. So oral repetition. And if you were to go throughout the annals of history, you would see that the number one aid or mnemonic tool to memorizing is orally speaking it, orally repeating it. Yep. In fact, on the table as you exit, there's a few books and CDs and DVDs you may or may not be interested in. Uh, and one of them is on the history of memorizing in Judaism and Christianity. How did they mem the ancients memorize? We've we got about 50 different techniques they use. Why did they do it? Uh, what does the Bible say about memorization, etc.? There's also uh, some other resources. There's a book on the geography and archaeology of Israel, and there's one on the culture and religion, and there's a commentary on Genesis 1 to 11. There's also some DVDs of the Bible spoken from memory in Israel. Uh, we have the entire book of Revelation spoken from memory in the old city of Jerusalem, Genesis 1 through 11, and etc. cetera. Uh, I, yeah, Pastor. Um, I, if I remember right, on your website, you had some segmenting exactly. of some things. Does certain genre of scripture 
some poetry mm -hmm. or narrative mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is some of that genre more conducive mm -hmm. to, to that? What yeah, that's know? a great question. Yes. And, and, you know, we lose in the translation a lot of the built-in memorization techniques and tips. Like the Bible in Hebrew is much easier to memorize. It's made to memorize. There's so many puns and so many acrostics and, and built-in helps that you lose in translation. But still in English, you're right. It is easier, as for me, certain genres and others to memorize. Um, something that's a narrative, a story, is, is much easier to me than, say, a, a, like Romans, which is very doctrinal. Yeah, yeah, yep. Anyone else? Question? Yes, sir. I, I believe you were uh, reciting uh, King James. Yes, sir. And you get confused from other translations, uh, <laughs> or do you stay away from them? Well, that's a good question. And um, we use King James and New King James. And uh, like Revelation's New King James, Genesis 1 to 11's King James. And that brings up a point. Um, in the research I did, I found a medieval Christian source that said, whatever you do your whole life, only use the same book, the same Bible, the same exact codex, right? That because you know where Jonah starts and where Romans starts and that format is very conducive to memorizing. That's why in one of the Jews' holy books, the Talmud, if you go from here to the end of the earth, page 58 is the same. Because when they open it, that's imprinted on their mind. Yep. Yep. So you stick that? With I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I don't even like to listen to Revelation <laughs> spoken in any other translation because it'll mess me up, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I started in King James, mm -hmm. and then we used the ESV here, and I tried and tried and tried. I got nowhere, so I didn't memorize for the longest time. And then finally I thought, you know, what's better to memorize in the King James, which I can? So I went back to King James, and um, so it's, it's really working a lot better. Well, yeah, you know, some translations for some people are easier than others, because that's what you grew up with. You know, but the other translations are really good translations, which the ESV is a great translation. And there might be parts of that that are easier to memorize for a younger person because they don't have that, that pre-exposure to KJV. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Anyone else? Question? Comment? Concern? Yeah. I was just curious if you are, well, what other languages you're communicating. Uh -huh. Well, I barely speak good English. <laughs> okay. That's my fiance's department. She graduated from Northwestern, or wife's department. <laughs> Just seeing if she's listening. She got a bachelor's degree in linguistics from Northwestern College, yeah. But, you know, living in Israel the last four years, you can get around just fine with English. And I do a lot of missionary work there on the street. And being a cowboy, <laughs> speaking slang English is a tremendous advantage doing evangelism there. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Question? Comment? Concern? Yeah. Do you want to talk about your work with the orphans? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question, Audrey. You have seen one half of the coin. The other side of the coin is by speaking the Bible from memory, we have Christian schools and orphanages and widows programs that are in West Africa and India and Haiti. And uh, we do not charge to come to a place to speak. We just ask them to take a, an offering. And sometimes churches don't do that, and they just write a check, which is fine. Okay? And that's how we exist. And a portion of that that's given to us on a Wednesday or Sunday or Thursday or whatever goes to the kids and to the ladies in West Africa and India and Haiti. We really believe what James says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And that's what we did. On our way home from our honeymoon in Israel, we stopped in Ghana, Africa, where Word Sower, our ministry, has a base. And for two weeks, we helped with the kids and, you know, no running water, on and off electricity. Uh, you know, I lived on pineapples for two weeks. <laughs> and I got a little hint of why the children of Israel would complain 
because they ate the same thing every day for 40 years. After two weeks, I never wanted to see a pineapple again. <laughs> and I get home, and what's on the table at my mom's house? A big pineapple tummy. It's like, ah! But you know how those missions trips are. You've been on them, or you've heard about them. They, you know, God blesses America. Big time. Because when we got to the grocery store, it was just like, wow. You know, God does bless America. He does. And it does something to you. You know, it makes you want to work harder while you're here for them because they are just stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, that's their lot. And it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Well, if you know of any other churches or schools or camps or whatever <laughs> that might like to have us come, we speak everywhere and anywhere. Uh, we speak the Hebrews 11 passage, which I just did, and we also do Genesis 1 to 11 and Revelation and James and Ruth and et cetera, and more information on us is on the table outside. So thank you so much, Audrey and Ron, for telling Pastor. And Pastor, thank you so much for letting us come. It's been a really great blessing, and I hope you were inspired. God bless. Well, that's, that's phenomenal, and uh, we love the word here, and it's so good to hear the word spoken. Um, as you heard, Tom and Sarah, his uh, once fiance, now, uh, what do you call that? Next wife, thank you, yeah, okay. All right, we're in good company here. We're on a roll. Um, they travel, they haven't collected support, and so they are living by faith, trusting that the Lord will provide for their needs and the needs of these other ministries that mean a lot to them. We have, uh, we have some funds that we have set aside for them that we're going to give them this evening as a church, but, but if you would like, if you would like to contribute to their ministry, feel free to deposit any love offering that you'd like to give. Uh, in light of the presentation, you can place it in the offering box that's out there next to the bookshelves. You're certainly free to do that, and we'll be happy to send that along. Uh, you can certainly send that along yourself if you'd like. But um, if after hearing this, you would like to support them, do a little bit more, uh, feel free to submit some money in that, in that uh, offering box out there, and we'll make sure to send that along to them. Um, another way that you can simply support him is just go and purchase their material. A lot of good material. Uh, he mentioned some of the books that, that he has out there. Um, Oral Transmission, um, The Culture and Religion of the Holy Land, a commentary on Genesis 1 through 11. Um, there's also some archaeology and history of Israel that he's put together. And after living there four years, I mean, what a phenomenal place to be for four years and to be able to learn about um, all the geography and history there. Just phenomenal. So it was good. It was good. And thank you, Tom and Sarah, for being with us this evening. Newlyweds, nine weeks into their marriage. And so what a wonderful blessing uh, to have them here with us.